live from the Allison B. Parker Studio in the School of Media Arts and Design at James Madison University, this is Breeze TV. Welcome back to Breeze TV. I'm Maggie Rickerby. And I'm Colby Reese. We start our broadcast today with the news that three JMU students have died in a car accident in West Virginia. Two other JMU students were life flighted from the scene last night and were in critical condition according to the police. Tim Miller, Vice President of Student Affairs, said in the message to the university that families of the students have been notified. Our news director, Zoe Mowry, is live at UVA Hospital with more details. Thanks, thanks Maggie. I'm here at UVA Hospital where at least one student is being treated with life-threatening injuries. The crash occurred in Hardy County, West Virginia on Route 259 on the state line at 10.30 p.m. last night. The vehicle was moving south when it left the roadway and hit a tree. Road conditions were clear and there was no sign of skid marks on the road. This is all according to a press release from the Sheriff's Office and the crash is still being investigated. It left three out of the five dead and two, the driver and another passenger, were airlifted. All were current JMU students. While JMU nor police have confirmed any names, the Breeze obtained an email from St. Christopher's School in Richmond, Virginia, saying that Luke Ferguson died in the wreck and Baird Weisenletter is currently being treated at the hospital behind me. I'll have more later on in the show on JMU's response and how they're helping students after this fatal accident. Back to you all in the studio. Thank you for that breaking news update, Zoe. The Bridgewater College community this week is remembering the two officers fatally shot on campus a year ago. They held a remembrance ceremony to unveil a memory site for officers John Painter and J.J. Jefferson. Students and staff reflected on healing from the shooting. On a frigid February day, the warmth of the Bridgewater community melted the snow that had fallen just hours ago. The feelings we experienced of grief and sadness of loneliness and loss were so profound and felt so deeply because our college's greatest strength, what we now know to be our most distinctive feature, is the closeness and connection we feel for each other. Closeness and connection ran deep at the remembrance ceremony held to honor the lives of police officer John Painter and campus safety officer J.J. Jefferson, who were killed in an on-campus shooting one year ago. The crowd filled with Bridgewater staff and students, the officers, family members, and community members alike, who were all impacted by the shooting. We share a common bond of hope and a love for each other that will not relent. Behind the speakers is the site of broken ground where construction is beginning for a memorial. The design will symbolize the connection that the Bridgewater community continues to feel. Steel piers growing closer and taller in a graceful arcing wall is based on the concept of individuals coming together. Celebrating the commemoration, people gathered to grieve, remembering the dent that was left when John and JJ passed. I'm grateful to have counted those men as colleagues and friends and family. As deep as our loss was, the loss suffered by the families of John and JJ has been deeper, their grief and anguish more profound. They are a part of our family and we are walking with them still. Alongside the Bridgewater community, the officers' families are walking with each other. Jacob Painter, the nephew of Officer John Painter, says he has built a connection with J.J. Jefferson's loved ones over the past year. They're pretty much family now. They know that. Because I can promise right now, if Uncle John was best friends with J.J., I know he was one hell of a guy. <laughs> he reflected on the value of his loss and played the song that he wrote for his uncle's funeral, a song he says is hard for him to hear today. For it to be a year and still have the amount of people that I've had reach out and it shows how the community that we live in, like everybody really does, actually, everybody cares about everybody. This support has spread online. On the anniversary, many Bridgewater students spoke out about their experience of the shooting, including Giovanni Ardelin, who had a direct view. I kind of got up to peek my head out of the window and that's when I saw everything um, and it's terrifying and some of those kids were, were in my class with me and you know didn't really speak to them and then after that uh, we, we stay in touch. Bridgewater junior Karis David also spoke from a student perspective at the Remembrance event. 
Despite the pain that the community was feeling, she says when she went outside on the evening of February 1st, 2022, there was a vibrant sunset. Time slowed down and we stood there taking it all in. I remember turning to one of my close friends in that moment out on the campus mall, looking around, looking at the sky, memorizing the faces of my friends and thinking this is a beautiful moment. How can there be such beauty in a moment that also feels so tainted with sadness and shock? We need the sunshine, but we also need the rain, the sun sets and the sun rises. Reporting for Breeze TV from Bridgewater College, I'm Sam Game. Thanks, Sam. And the man accused of the shooting is scheduled to face trial in 2024. Coming up next on Breeze TV. Women continue to make their mark in the sports world. And the Duke slam dunk on an in-state rival. Then, how tons of teddy bears make a change. Stay tuned. Bojangles, Cajun Filet Biscuit. For breakfast, lunch, or dinner, nothing compares to our signature Cajun Spice Chicken Breast Filet on a made-from-scratch buttermilk biscuit. Breakfast so good, we serve it all day. Get the best chicken biscuit. The one, the only Cajun Filet Biscuit. For a limited time, get two Cajun Filet Biscuits for just $5. Bojangles, it's bow time. The one, the only, Bojangles Cajun Filet Biscuit. Nothing compares to our signature Cajun Spice Chicken Breast Filet on a made from scratch buttermilk biscuit. Bojangles Cajun Filet Biscuit is so good, we serve it all day. For a limited time, get two Cajun Filet Biscuits for just $5. Bojangles, it's bow time. Head to Bojangles for a Chicken Supremes combo with your choice of fixin', a made from scratch buttermilk biscuit, and a drink. Bojangles, it's bow time. Tailgating is a song heard across campuses, parking lots, and open fields. They say this song can be heard elsewhere, and perhaps this is true, but it is nowhere near as bright, nowhere near as loud, nowhere near as triumphant as it is right here. Tailgating may not have been born here, but here is where tailgaters are born. This is Breeze TV. Title IX, quote, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in education programs receiving federal financial assistance. Athletics are considered an integral part of an institution's education program and are therefore covered by this law, end quote. Take a look into how this legislation still shines through the JMU community. As JMU celebrates the 50th anniversary of Title IX, women recognize what it's given to them. Title IX, it, it's my life. It impacts everything I've done and get to do and my job and my passion and I don't know what I would do without it. It's everything to me. While Title IX may be a complex issue with many details, putting it simply can help see its worth. I want to be treated like a person. I don't think anybody's greater than and anybody's less than. Everybody needs to be treated for who they are and for what they bring, not for the gender that they live with. Remembering what it has done for women's athletics, it's important to honor those who paved the way. I think it's important to remember sort of trailblazers or where we were 50 years ago and where we are now. And I think it helps encourage and inspire to keep wanting to move forward and to keep you know dreaming big for women. Creating equal chances to play on the field also leads to breaking barriers in other areas. You know, as we continue to progress, we continue to see women doing things that we didn't know were possible. Women being officials in men's sports, women coaching men. While being given the same opportunities to play the sport they love, women also can empower themselves. Women who are confident and carry themselves well and communicate well and all those things that sports can give us, high character, it, it propels us forward. Being able to evaluate ourselves is crucial as even more progress can be made. We all have a responsibility to take a look at where we are and take a look at where we want to be and talk to the right people to fill that gap. It's, it's everybody's responsibility to take a stand for themselves and for equal representation and for equal opportunity. Reporting for Breeze TV, this is Colby Reese.
To explore more women in sports, our reporter Alexa Mania is live in studio with WHSV sports anchor Perry Shinen. Alexa? Thanks, Colby. So, Perry, what, it's like, what is it like being a female sports journalist in a male-dominated field? Well, I mean, honestly, it's just an honor. It's something that I've worked towards my whole life. I played tennis in college, and having the chance to compete in a sport where it's one of the only sports where there's equal pay at the Grand Slams for women and men. So then heading into a male-dominated space like this, I felt confident. That's good. So what inspired you to go into this field? Well, it started when I was very young. My mom, who played tennis for her entire life, played in college and then played professionally. So I really saw a female role model for me from a young age. and. Once I was in the industry, just seeing the women that had broken barriers before me and really created a path for me to follow. Do you have any advice for young women looking to go into sports journalism? Yeah, I mean, it comes from inside you. So if it's something that you're passionate about, there's nothing that should stop you. Thank you so much for joining us, Perry. And happy Women, Women's in Sports Day, even if it is a few days late. Back to you all at the main desk. Thanks, Alexa. JMU men's basketball defeated the Old Dominion Monarchs in Norfolk last night, winning 78-73. The Dukes never trailed in the Royal Rivalry, stretching their lead to 14 at one point in the first half. Nicole Molson led the charge, putting up 18 points while adding 9 assists. Julian Wooden contributed 17 points as well, 15 of which came from beyond the arc. Coach Mark Byington attributed the team's aggressive game playing to the victory. Breeze TV traveled to Norfolk to catch the action in person, recapping the Duke's victory. Ellie Finza shows us what she uncovered. JMU defeated in-state rival ODU for the first time since joining the Sun Belt Conference. Coming off a disappointing loss, the Monarchs give credit to the Dukes for their tough offense during the game. Yeah, it's hard, but that's the type of team they are. They got great offense, they got some side makers, so do all that, we gotta just keep playing. Monarchs head coach Jeff Jones puts the game simply. Hats off to, to James Madison. I mean, they just played better than us tonight. JMU's head coach Mark Byington emphasizes the importance of this conference victory for his team. Anytime you get a win, we're trying to fight, trying to climb, just like everybody else is. So um, I was proud of our guys. It's a heck of a win, but it's a Sunbelt Road win, and um, we try to take as many of as we can get. Byington says the Dukes approach the game with the right mindset, one that can carry them through the remainder of their road trip. Our guys play fearless, and you, you saw we played to win. If we made mistakes, it wasn't because we were going to play timid or play scared. We played to win, and that was um, you know, a great example of that. Looking ahead, Jamie will ride a three-game winning streak to Appalachian State for a matchup with the Mountaineers on Saturday at 4 p.m. <laughs> Reporting for Breeze TV alongside Eric Schellhaus and Sam Reinard, I'm Ellie Fenza. Sports at us. Excuse me. Sports editor Madison Heritzik takes a deeper dive into the, one of the most successful spring programs as their season approaches with some uncertainty. Just eight days away from their season opening trip to UNC, JMU Lacrosse has a new goalie, a new preseason ranking, and a new conference to call home. The Dukes are now a part of the American Athletic Conference, competing as an affiliate program against top competitors like Florida, Vanderbilt, and Temple. Playing Florida, they're a top 10 program, and they're going to be a great um, matchup. But honestly, every team in this conference is going to be a, a, a gritty one. So we're looking forward to every single one, and the one that's circled is the one that's next on the schedule. But before they get into conference play, the Dukes will face some familiar non-conference foes. Playing like top teams in the nation pushes us and, you know, uh, lets us learn quick and early like what we need to work on. JMU's lineup will also have a new goalie for the first time in six years, redshirt senior Kat Buchanan. The difference is one's righty, one's lefty. Kat's going to step up just the way, same way Molly did and make saves and she knows her job and she's going to get it done. Buchanan will have some help from her best friend and returning captain Rachel Mady on defense, who's one of the loudest on the field. Having Rachel there always communicating is really big. I don't want her to feel like she is the only one that's communicating, so we need to always be up for her also. She's loud and, and she's making sure that she's doing her job, but we always need to step up and be there with her. The team's expectations are clear, despite the changes and uncertainty of the last two seasons, with some personal goals. I want to be an All-American. And team goals. Representing JMU in the championship game. The Dukes are well on their way as the team is ranked second in the AAC preseason polls. You know, I'm confident that we have the ability once we're there to do what it takes to win, but we need to be there in year one. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Madison Heritzik. 
An annual JMU Athletics event gained a new partner this year, which is taking the program to new heights. Our reporter Colby Reese dove into how the connections came about. At halftime of the JMU men's basketball win over Yola Monroe on Saturday, teddy bears filled the court with the items soon making their way to the UVA Children's Hospital. The event came together with already established connections between Dairy Queen and the hospital. Kind of happened organically, right? Like we identified the teddy bear toss right away for them. I said, hey, this is a really fun thing that we do. It happens to be available for you to sponsor. From Dairy Queen's perspective, getting involved in the program was a huge opportunity. Franchisee Jane Blackburn talked about how the toss informs the JMU student body on how they can help. There are businesses in town that support Children's Hospital and when they come to us, they can still support while they're in town by coming to Dairy Queen. It's a win-win. Aaron Chandler, Assistant Director of Development for UVA Children's Hospital, spoke about how something as small as a teddy bear can bring joy to the children during tough times. As a little kid, coming into a really scary, uncomfortable environment where they're not really sure what's going on or why, having these types of comfort items available makes the experience a little bit better. JMU Athletics hopes to use its resources to continue to create change. It showcases our ability to do unique things with a unique platform that we have, you know, show support to those who support us. All sides of the trio look to move forward together to make this an annual event for years to come. Reporting from the court for Breeze TV, this is Colby Reese. Lou Campanelli, JMU men's basketball head coach from 1972 to 1985, passed away Tuesday evening. Campanelli led the Dukes to two NCAA Division II championships in his 13-year career. He was inducted into JMU's Hall of Fame in 1999 due to his impact on JMU athletics. We would now like to take a moment to remember the life and legacy left by Lou Campanelli. Bojangles, Cajun Filet Biscuit. For breakfast, lunch, or dinner, nothing compares to our signature Cajun Spice Chicken Breast Filet on a made-from-scratch buttermilk biscuit. Breakfast so good, we serve it all day. Get the best chicken biscuit. The one, the only Cajun Filet Biscuit. For a limited time, get two Cajun Filet Biscuits for just $5. Bojangles, it's bow time. The one, the only, Bojangles Cajun Filet Biscuit. Nothing compares to our signature Cajun Spice Chicken Breast Filet on a made-from-scratch buttermilk biscuit. Bojangles Cajun Filet Biscuit is so good, we serve it all day. For a limited time, get two Cajun Filet Biscuits for just $5. Bojangles, it's bow time. Head to Bojangles for a Chicken Supremes combo with your choice of fixin', a made-from-scratch buttermilk biscuit, and a drink. Bojangles, it's bow time. Tailgating is a song heard across campuses, parking lots, and open fields. They say this song can be heard elsewhere, and perhaps this is true. But it is nowhere near as bright, nowhere near as loud, nowhere near as triumphant as it is right here. Tailgating may not have been born here, but here is where tailgaters are born. This is Breeze TV. We are back live and we have some updates from Zoe Mowry. Zoe? Thanks, Maggie. As news of the tragedy reaches out, Tim Miller, Vice, Tim Miller, Vice President of Student Affairs, sent an email to students this morning, both confirming the crash and sending his support to those affected. He ends his email with, please know we're here to support you and ask each of you to lean on one another. And Mary Hope Vass, Director of Communications, sent a statement to the Breeze, explaining the heavy heart left on campus as they mourn the loss of these students. Vass says JMU is currently working on ways to provide counseling across campus. Finally, Senator, Senator Tim Kaine also tweeted, Heartbreaking news. My heart is with the students' families and the whole JMU community. If you or someone you know needs help from the JMU Counseling Center during this time, you can reach out to their number at 540-568-6552. Back to you all in the studio. Thank you for those updates, Zoe. 
February 1st marked the beginning of Black History Month. President Gerald Ford made Black History Month official in 1976. The reason for its celebration in February is to honor the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Fred Frederick Douglass. Today we recognize Black History Month to acknowledge the struggles and honor the achievements of African Americans. To celebrate, read, listen, and learn about the true history and meaning of Black History Month. To further learn about Black History Month, head to FuriousFlower.org. At 92 years old, Doug Wilder remains an active voice in Virginia politics. In honor of Black History Month, executive producer Caleb Brown revives an exclusive interview with the former governor as he reflects on his life and legacy as the first black governor of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. I never wanted to go into politics. I never wanted to go around smiling and grinning and shaking hands and begging for money. And yet, I knew that in the absence of somebody being there for the people, that if I didn't do it, then why could I complain about someone else not doing it? Richmond, 1951. It's segregated. And a young Doug Wilder has just received a chemistry degree. He has also received a draft card for the U.S. Army. Decades later, an older Wilder recalls integration in the war zones of Korea, something he says he never experienced in America. Well, how can this exist in the Army and not exist in real life? And that stayed with me. Until he was finally given the opportunity to do something about it. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education decision. And uh, I said, I've, I've got to get into the mix. And the mix, as I saw it then, was to be in law. Wilder made Virginia history as the first black state senator since Reconstruction and the first to hold statewide office. In 1989, he became the first black governor of the United States. Despite Virginia's past, he was not deterred. I've been through hell. I almost died in Korea. And uh, no, it didn't scare me at all. Today, Wilder teaches at a school in his honor within Virginia Commonwealth University. He's an advocate for nonpartisan politics. I believe that all people should be treated the same. Now, does that make me a liberal? No. No a moderate, no a conservative. It makes me a human being. He's a father, a veteran, a lawyer, a teacher, and a governor that made history. Yet, Wilder says his work is not done. And his best advice for the next generation is to find gratitude in the present. Success is not an end game. You never get there. You continue to work there. And when you leave, you should be able to say, I did all I could do with what I had. I make no complaints. For Breeze TV, I'm Kayla Brown. With more on politics, we're going to throw it over to our political correspondent, Regine Arnazari, with more. Regine? Good afternoon, JMU. I'm Regine Arnazari, and this is Breeze TV Politics. The U.S. reached its $31.4 trillion debt limit on January 19th, and Congress faces the challenge of reaching a bipartisan decision to raise it in order to avoid a U.S. default. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy rejected a clean debt ceiling increase after a meeting with President Biden on Wednesday. To win over the bid for G GOP House Speaker, McCarthy agreed to raise the debt ceiling under the condition of government spending cuts. However, Republicans will not reveal their proposed budget cuts. Opportunity to pressure the Democratic Party to uh, commit to spending cuts that the Republican base, the Republican uh, elites would like to see and can't get done under normal circumstances. So they use the debt ceiling as a, a hold it hostage in order to gain policies, in this case, uh, maybe potentially draconian spending cuts uh, that would otherwise not be popular and not be able to be passed. If the government does default on its debt, it could potentially spark a financial crisis and decrease confidence in the American market, as well as affect payments for Medicare, Social Security, and other federal benefits. To get a view outside of the Valley, here's your national news rundown. We first want to turn our attention to Memphis, Tennessee, where Tyre Nichols, a 29-year-old black man, was beaten to death by five police officers on January 7th. Nichols was laid to rest on Wednesday after his death sparked mass protests and the disbandment of the perpetuating team, the Scorpion Unit. Minnesota Representative and Democrat Ilhan Omar has been removed from her seat as the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Omar is the third Democrat to be removed from such a position since midterms. House Speaker McCarthy denies this is an act of political targeting. 
On the other side of the country, mourners na nationwide have gathered to honor the lives lost in a series of seven mass shootings within the month of January in California, a state notable for its restrictions on firearms. The Ways and Center released a poll this month finding that 50% of Virginians approve of Governor Glenn Youngkin's performance, while 36% disapprove. However, Virginians had mixed emotions regarding Youngkin's policies, with 57% opposing his plan to, in to lower the income tax rate and 66% against pulling Virginia out of the Clean Economy Act. 43% of voters support Virginia's current abortion laws, with 29% preferring more permissive laws and 23% wanting more restrictions. On the other hand, 59% of Virginians support requiring parent approval of K-12 student name and pronoun changes. That's all for politics. Back to y'all at the main desk. Thanks, Regine. Coming up on Breeze TV. A new Paul Lissy to securing your furry friend. And with beauty comes danger in this new Liz and B exhibit. Then a new coffee shop emerges on campus. Keep it here. Bojangles, Cajun filet biscuit for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Nothing compares to our signature Cajun Spice Chicken Breast Filet on a made-from-scratch buttermilk biscuit. Breakfast so good, we serve it all day. Get the best chicken biscuit. The one, the only Cajun Filet Biscuit. For a limited time, get two Cajun Filet Biscuits for just $5. Bojangles, it's bow time. The one. The only. Bojangles, Cajun Filet Biscuit. Nothing compares to our signature Cajun Spice Chicken Breast Filet on a made-from-scratch buttermilk biscuit. Bojangles Cajun Filet Biscuit is so good, we serve it all day. For a limited time, get two Cajun Filet Biscuits for just $5. Bojangles, it's bow time. Head to Bojangles for a Chicken Supremes combo with your choice of fixin', a made-from-scratch buttermilk biscuit, and a drink. Bojangles, it's bow time. Tailgating is a song heard across campuses, parking lots, and open fields. They say this song can be heard elsewhere, and perhaps this is true. But it is nowhere near as bright, nowhere near as loud, nowhere near as triumphant as it is right here. Tailgating may not have been born here, but here is where tailgaters are born. This is Breeze TV. If you are looking to get a dog in Harrisonburg, you are now required to obtain a license for your furry companion. Harrisonburg City Treasurer Jeff Schaefer tells us how college students can get their dog license in Harrisonburg, something that college students in the area may not know about. You can go to the SPCA. We do. Um, issue them uh, a couple boxes of tags at a time mm -hmm. and so if you happen to go to the SPCA to get shots or that's where you got your dog then they do have the, the licenses there the license the tags that you can get straight from them or you can come here and all you need to do is bring in that signed uh, copy of your rabies certificate from your vet. Mm -hmm. A violation of this code could lead to a class three or four misdemeanor, depending on whether or not your dog is sprayed or neutered. More information on the licensing process can be found on the official Harrisonburg website. A gallery with a historical touch comes to Lisenby Museum. I discovered the beautiful side of weaponry in this new exhibit. Violence, destruction, and war. These are the words that come to mind when we think about weapons. A new exhibit at Lisenby Museum encourages visitors to challenge those ideas and view weapons in an artistic light. This is what dangerous beauty, weapons as art, is all about. Jenny Sankson said she came up with the idea through a love for the beauty behind weaponry. Oftentimes our expectations can really color what we learn about an object, so coming in and looking at it through a lens of art can offer 
offer new perspective. Weapons from all over the world and several different time periods are on display at the exhibit. Each weapon tells its own story. All of the artifacts were hand-picked and researched by student interns like Anthony Cordova Ramirez. He said that it's helpful for students to come to Lisenby to make real-world connections with what they are learning. That makes you more interested than just reading it in a textbook. It brings these eras and these people to life. It adds a human element to it. Maria Harvey said that the aesthetics of the pieces in the gallery are important. I think it's always really useful to see people living in different ways and different ways of understanding the world and your space in the world. Sankson encourages museum goers to immerse themselves into the cultures and time periods that are not their own. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Maggie Rickerby. Well, thank you for tuning in to our episode of Breeze TV this week. We just wanted to say, with everything going on, if you need to reach out to somebody, please make sure to do so and take time for yourself. And know that you are not alone during tough times. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be here next time, same time, same place. See you later.